Welcome to the CEC Report for the 11th of May 2018. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Robert Barwick, CEC Research Director. Welcome, Robert. Thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, how to survive the oncoming financial crisis and Trump's Iran foolishness could spark World War III. So firstly today, how to survive the oncoming financial crisis. Now, we're often asked from you know, supporters, from activists, from people that leave comments on the show, how do I protect my money? How yep. do I protect, protect my future? Uh, how do I secure my position? Now, really, there is only one answer to that, and it's the same answer that we always give, and that is that we must secure certain policies, and they're going to be policies that we'll run through in terms of the practical measures required to get through this crisis. Because really, a crisis is a great equaliser. Whether you're a prince or a pauper, it doesn't matter. Unless we make sure certain policies are enacted top down, then we won't, none of us will make it, and whether even humanity makes it will be a question mark. There's nothing you can do for yourself personally that's guaranteed to work. You know, try everything, go nuts. What you have to do, whatever, when you're trying that, you've got to think what's good for everybody as a whole, yeah. the nation as a whole. That's how you protect yourself individually. And that's what politics is, that's why it was invented. It's about people getting together to conspire, to implement policies uh, and, in, and set up institutions to affect those policies. For common good. Exactly. So, and that's what government is as well. Um, so firstly, Glass-Steagall, I think everyone, regular viewers know what Glass-Steagall is and we'll talk about it a lot today, including from the standpoint of what it is not, because there's a lot of discussion about breaking up the banks that's occurring in the wake of the Royal Commission findings. Um, of course, Glass-Steagall is uh, a complete severance between any kind of gambling and between deposit taking. The, gam the, the financial speculation is a cancer that's taken over the financial system in the last, say, 40 years, Elisa. We've got to get it out of the real financial system. That's what Glass-Steagall does. Mm. Nothing short of that is going to be give us a successful financial system going forward. Right? Mm. So it's the most important thing. And then we'll also uh, discuss the reorganisation that would be required because, as people point out, You've got a housing bubble that needs to be deflated, that needs to happen in an orderly way. And we have written legislation in the past, such as the homeowners and bank protection legislation to make that happen. So those things are critical and things like a debt moratorium to restructure the unpayable debts of productive industries and farms. Uh, then you've got the question of national banking, where we need to establish a bank of the nation to issue the credit to build uh, rebuild the nation, which leads me to the final point, which is the economic reconstruction, emergency economic reconstruction to rebuild the nation with things that are critically needed. So listen, just on those points, back to Glass-Steagall first, I, I want to make an appeal to all the viewers of the show. Get in, If you haven't already, get involved in our current campaign for, of, of getting ordinary citizens to contact their Member of Parliament about the Glass-Steagall legislation that Bob Catter will introduce into the parliament. He, he's declared his intention to introduce it. He needs an MP to step forward and second it. Um, and it's only going to happen if those MPs feel enough pressure from the public. I want to read a quick quote. We'll, we'll, we'll refer to this in a minute as well. But in the, um, the Times on the 2nd of May, they were talking about how they're, they're listening, the, the, uh, the London banks are nervous about the Royal Commission in Australia. And when they were recapping on the, how the Royal Commission came about, this Times journalist who wrote, its banks are, its, Australia's banks are having a tougher time and they have lost some of the dominant hold they used to have over politicians opening the door to the Royal Commission. And that's actually a, a reference of how the corruption in our system works. They, they're just talking about it casually. Yeah, the banks had a hold mm. over politicians. But it's also true that's weakening. And it's, it, when it weakens, then you, the public, have a say. But you've got to do it. Every mm. call, every email, every visit you make to members of parliament with this legislation, the CEC's bill... Um, that, that we've drafted, that Bobcat is going to introduce, adds to the pressure on them to actually do something. And even today in the paper, the Treasury has come out today saying, we need to look at breaking up the banks, right? Ask the Royal Commission to look at that. That's what you're intersecting when you're doing that. So we really need people to do that. We need you to sign the change.org petition. And if you're watching this on YouTube, there's a link below you, you can do that. Go to change.org and look for the petition that is calling on members of parliament to back this bill. Right? Actually, if you haven't signed it already, go ahead and sign it straight away. Very important. Every time you sign it, 
members of parliament get, there's a, there's a bunch of emails go off to key MPs telling them that someone else has supported it, right? So you've got to do that. Um, and then in terms of the, the other areas that you've, Lisa's just mentioned, uh, of, you know, because Glass-Steagall's the first step and there's these other areas of economic reorganisation and the question of a national bank. You can call in and get a copy of this that we've just relieved. It's, it's our manual on a national bank, right, and how national banking would work, but it also recaps what's, what's the, st the problems with the current system, including APRA. So you can see the headline there, the next financial crash is certain in the Bank of England, Bank for International Settlements, APRA Bankers Dictatorship, time for Glass-Steagall banking separation in a national bank. And in there we lay out every, as comprehensively as we can how this system would work. If you want to know what's required for your country to, to reorganise so that all of us can be secure going forward, mm. call in and get a copy of this. And thanks to those people who have been emailing us the letters that they've sent to their MPs and also do the same with feedback because we need to keep, uh, we need to monitor exactly who and where they are, what their position is, who's supporting this and who's not. That's critical to the mobilisation. Now, as you said, uh, Robert, we've had international coverage and you referenced the London Times there. So there are shockwaves sweeping the world after this Royal Commission. Uh, where the worry is that the talk of banking separation here in Australia is going to lead to a renewed push for it in the UK in particular, as well as the United States. Of course, we've had a number of people, Alan Fells, the former Australian uh, Competition Consumer Council, Bernie Fraser, former Reserve Bank, a number of MPs pointing towards banking separation as a possible solution, Wacker Williams, even Green Senator Peter Wish Wilson, Barnaby Joyce, and many and, other voices. And the Treasury today, like I said, in the Australian yeah. newspaper, they've, they've talked well, about. Well, that it. was what I was about to get to because in the Treasury, well, this this is actually the result. We should add that after uh, the last hearings of the Royal Commission, the two-week um, block, Rowena or uh, the special uh, Queen's Council assisting um, the um, Kenneth, Kenneth Haynes, the commissioner. Uh, she had demanded that banks, the banks and regulators all answer the query as to whether they should be, why they should be able to continue with the vertically integrated model of banking where banks are allowed to not only take people's deposits but give them financial advice, sell their own products to them, sell them insurance and so forth. So they had to justify that to the Royal Commission. So the submissions have just come out. The Treasury submission said that the Commission should investigate what the benefits were from breaking up the banks, that just disclosure would not be enough. Uh, it said conflicts of interest are also inherent in such business models and that separation would have benefits. So that was quite clear. ASIC uh, said that the um, model of vertical integration and its benefits should be examined, though it did defend some aspects of the model. Well, they, def they defend what they call economy. They said it has economies of scale. Mm. Yes, it has, ASIC. You, you have no credibility, and the banks certainly have, they have economies of scale, all right. They can fleece people on an industrial scale with vertical integration. And of course, no surprise, the banks completely defended the model, uh, saying consumers would miss out on ample benefits if it, if it was dispensed with, uh, and that we can manage the conflict yeah. of interest, which of course, there's ample evidence that they cannot I manage. Think that's, I think the bank's response is key, Elisa, because what's happened lately is banks have been voluntarily divesting themselves of certain businesses, and politicians will have, are being given this message, oh look, the banks are doing it anyway. No, what this shows is the banks are saying, do not dare force us to do it because there's something there they don't want to be mm. broken off from. Yeah, your deposits, that's what they don't want to be cut off from. Mm. Now, we've got to take a quick break, but after this, we'll come back and talk about uh, Clayton's models of Glass-Steagall breaking up the banks um, that will not work. Welcome back to the CEC Report where we're talking about how to survive the oncoming global financial crisis. Now, we were just talking about all the momentum uh, towards banking separation, which now even the Treasury is suggesting we need to look into rather closely. Um, now, of course, we've seen this happen before. In the United Kingdom in 2013, there was incredible momentum for Glass-Steagall. And in order to stop it, what was put forward was a model that fell short of full Glass-Steagall banking separation. And our media in Australia has referred to that model. It came out of the uh, UK's 2011 Independent Commission on Banking. So that was kind of their Royal Commission. 
Uh, and the result of that, it was um, led by Sir John Vickers. Uh, he was former Bank of England and so forth. He was, he's now known as the architect of what's called ring fencing, which was what he proposed, which fell short of Glass-Steagall. Um, now, in the Sydney Morning Herald on the 29th of April, uh, they cited John Vickers saying, and this was around that 2011 period, that ring fencing was a better solution than structural separation. So ring fencing is, instead of forcing the banks to break up into smaller entities where a separate bank has deposits, they say to these big mega banks, you've got to divide them internally, ring fence your deposit part, but you can stay under the one institution. Right? The one roof, you've got these yeah. Chinese walls between them, you can't do anything, but they can stay under the one institution. And it's really, it's not the real deal at all, and it's open for abuse. Yeah, but now the Sydney Morning Herald, they really need to subscribe to the Australian Alert <laughs> Service to get some more up-to-date information here, because several times in the last two to three years, John Vickers has actually come out saying, look, uh, British banks are still undercapitalised, they're vulnerable, the leverage in the British banking system is quote-unquote dangerously high, the regulators fell short of what was required to crisis-proof the system. And he said this again on the 2nd of May, and he concluded by saying, goodness knows what would happen if there was another systemic crash like the last one, which he's yep. indicating that there will be. So this was definitely dishonest reporting by the Sydney Morning Herald to, to quote Vickers from 2011 on how this is a better model because... They legislated in 2013 and it's now 2018 and he's saying this. Now, there's been virtually no progress in the British banks at all under this model, mm -hmm. right? So the whole thing is a, a fraud. Um, we warned at the time it would be the case. The bankers, that there was, there's a whole bunch of bankers in the House of Lords, at least ex-bankers, who they voted for a full glass steagle instead because they said, look, this isn't going to work. One mm. of them had this great line about how bankers are extremely adept at getting between the wallpaper and the wall, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have this division, they'll find a way around it. Um, and the other thing is, even if they don't find a way around it, if there's a crisis, the bank, the, in the investment banking side or some other side, the management of the bank will be really tempted to use the deposit side to bail that out, mm. right? And then that puts the deposits at risk. So no, it just doesn't work. You've got to have a full separation. Yeah, and um, part of the proof of that is the fact that before Glass-Steagall legislation was implemented in 1933, this model, which we yeah. today call ring fencing, is exactly what existed then. And you had banks like National City Bank um, that got around that existing legislation by setting up these securities affiliates that were under the same roof, but they were set completely separate. So we would just be going back to that disaster which led so, to Glass-Steagall. So what we're warning about is in the, the Australian debate at the moment, is that that position where that's, I suspect the Treasury and you know even though they've said this today, which is good, they're going to start wanting to water down the debate. So it, so at worst, for them, it becomes something like a ring fencing model, not yeah. full separation. The public must know the difference and insist on full separation. Yep. You, don't try, you don't try and change the culture of banking because, unfortunately, the love of money is the root of all evil. There's a quote <laughs> for you. And these financial people are too easily predators. So you've got to lock them away from the important financial system. Mm. Right? Don't try and change the culture. Lock them away from it. Now, the global financial crash oncoming, which many, many uh, high-level people are warning about, is driving the momentum, of course, to consider these solutions such as Glass-Steagall. And we want to briefly talk about a new book that is out by Naomi Prince, which is very significant because she's a former banker at both Wall Street and City of London firms such as Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs. Very high quali highly qualified, experienced former insider of the banking system, mm. who once she came out from it, has put out some of the most in informative material about how the banking system works and how important Glass-Steagall is. Yeah, she's a big supporter of Glass-Steagall. So her new book is called Collusion, How Central Bankers Rigged the World. And she goes through uh, the quantitative easing program, how central bankers worked together, colluded together in an extraordinary way. Uh, and she, she said this the other day, talking about her book. She said, look, today we stand near, how near we don't yet know, the edge of a dangerous financial precipice. The risks posed by the largest of the private banks still exist, only now they're even bigger than they were in 2007-08 and operating in an arena of even more debt. So this is... this. Um, 
expert, Naomi Prince, has she when she's not writing books like this, she's in the US Congress lobbying them to bro go back to full glass eagle, right? She it's a Senate she she writes her book around it, she explains it in her book. I can't recommend it enough. I've start it's you know, once I um, it only came out on the first or the second of May. It's really worth getting and looking at. Mm. Now we have to stop again and after the break we're going to talk about Iran. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Now we're discussing Trump's Iran foolishness could spark World War III. And just a reminder that regarding the last segment, there's more information in this week's Australian Alert Service about ring fencing and the financial crash on coming. So call in if you haven't already for a complimentary copy of that. Um, now, Iran. On 8th of May, Donald Trump announced the US would withdraw from the Joint Comprehensive Plan on Action, the JCPOA, that's the nuclear deal, uh, with Iran that the US would immediately reimpose sanctions. The other signatories of the deal, the UK, France, Germany, Russia, China and Iran itself, this, at this point are sticking to the deal and will try to keep it together. But the war danger has escalated dramatically because essentially um, Trump has given a green light to the escalation that's occurring in the region. Israel has been conducting military strikes in Syria for some time now, but from the beginning of April, it began making specific targeted bombing raids against Iranian army targets, not just Hezbollah, but Iranian army targets inside Syria. And this has expanded in the wake of Trump's decision. The Iranians launched rockets at targets in the Golan Heights, 20 rockets, none of them actually hit their targets. But Israel's response was extremely heavy-handed, with the most extensive strikes yet against Iranian target in Syria, uh, including in Damascus. Now, this is how it was portrayed on the news last night. Tensions in the Middle East have exploded into violence, with Iran launching a barrage of rockets into Israeli territory from bases in Syria. Israel returned fire, shelling Iranian positions inside Syria before ordering airstrikes on the capital, Damascus. It's not just the actions, Elisa, that's the danger of World War Three. it's the way the media reports it, so there's no truth there. Everything you just saw there is factually incorrect. They did not talk about the fact, they talk, they talk about it as if what Israel's doing is a retaliation, whereas Israel struck first into these Iranian targets, as you said, and the Iranians didn't hit Israel. They struck the Golan Heights, which is Syrian territory occupied by Israel, right? So it's just that kind of in reporting that to an Australian audience that just is a pack of lies. Mm. Now, um, it is dangerous. Iran is an ally of Russia. Um, Netanyahu himself in the country domestically is facing criminal, multiple criminal charges, so he needs a big distraction. But the key thing to look at really is Trump is getting very bad advice and there's a growing stable of neocons that are in there, including two of the latest uh, people who are incoming. That is the National Security Advisor John Bolton and New York City Mayor, former New York City Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. Uh, who's joined Trump's legal defence team. But both of these two have received, over a long term, funding from the MEK, the Mujahideen el Kark, a terrorist organisation which is part of a rebel group moving against the Iranian government. They were a terrorist organisation until Hillary Clinton took them off the list. Mm. And now they've been able to fund American politicians, etc., and, you know, infiltrate the Trump administration. And uh, John Bolton, for one figure, I mean, he was a key player in the setup of the Iraqi WMD scandal, um, because in the post 9-11 Iraq war period, he was in the Pentagon and the State Department. He was the go-to guy for Defence Secretary Donald Rumsfeld and Vice President Dick Cheney, who were leading the charge to invade seven countries in five years. You can see last yep. week's show for a video about that. Uh, and Bolton actually arranged for the infamous intelligence on yellow cake uranium having been procured by Iraq, being put into a fact sheet requested by the State Department, even though the CIA had already denied any merit to that report. And that led, of course, to the 2003 Iraq intervention. And Bolton led the campaign to get rid of the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Mohammed al baradai who had declared that there were no evidence of uh, nuclear weapons in Iran. So Bolton led the campaign to get him ousted. There's a lot of things that Donald Trump is not wrong about, Elisa. 
This is something he was wrong about from the beginning. In his mind, he would think he's delivering on election promise to get rid of, get out of this nuclear agreement with, with um, Iran. The problem is the people advising him to do it are the same people he denounced in his campaign at, for their regime change policies. Mm. And he's let them infiltrate him. Yep. And it's these two you've mentioned. It's is Israeli that? Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. They're all involved in the regime change architecture and now they're running the show, unfortunately. And there's another neocon incoming uh, as CIA Director Gina Haspel. She was at the CIA for 33 years, known as Bloody Gina for her role in the CIA torture program. Uh, and there's a group called Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity that has put out a statement demanding she not be um, confirmed as nominee. And we want to show a video of Ray McGovern, a member of VIPs, a former intelligence officer and CIA presidential briefer. He's 78 year old, years old and this is how he was treated when he tried to intervene at the hearing, confirmation hearing. Stop resisting. Stop resisting. Stop resisting. It's on the record. Stop resisting. Oh and in many respects, in many respects, you guys go into secret fighting. Stop resisting. I'm not resisting. Yes, you are. I'm give me your arm. Give me your arm. I'm lying on. Give me your arm. It's dislocated, man. Give me your arm. My left arm is Give me your arm. My left arm is dislocated, damn it. Give me your arm. Stop, Stop hurting him. I'm trying to stand. Just my left arm is. Ah! Hold on, hold on. Stop hold on, fighting. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, I'm hold not fighting. On, I'm on hold the on. ground. Hold on. And hold if you let me get my on, glasses on, on. I can see what's happening. You're hurting him. You guys are hurting me. Stop get hurting him. him. I'm immobilized. I'm immobilized. You're going to dislocate my shoulder again. And look, would you pick up my glasses before you step on them? Why does this require five pairs? We'll get you up first, sir. Well, how about giving me a new pen? Hold on. We're going to get you up first. We'll stop you, all right? I can stand up by myself. Hey! Shame on you for hurting him. Let me stand up by myself. I'm not a terrorist. Sir, get up when you I'm a CIA right. alumnus. Roll one aside. 27 years analyst and operations. Now sit up, sir. Waterboarding can never be Sir, are you going to stand up for us, sir? I'll stand up. All right, never come on, please. Stand up, please. Never be declared. Come on, stand up for us. Okay, let me get, let me get in here. Are you going to pick up a glass? Sir, we'll take care of it. We just want to get you up first, all right? Okay. All right. Waterboarding come on, stand up. can never be declared. Come on, stand up. Have one, have a seat. She personally supervised it in Thailand. Come on, stand up. Come on, stand up. That's not a secret. Stand up, sir. That's Thank only you. a secret because she won't recuse herself. Right, yeah, we'll she she won't deep my left, left or left. All right, look. My left you one is dislocated. Right? I'll, I'll go out, yeah. All right. I'll go out, but I wish, you, I wish that you wouldn't beat right? up an old man, huh? You decided uh, that you, you were an officer? I was an officer, too. Now these guys these guys are the thugs that actually torture people. Come on this way. Shame on you for hurting him. Analysts and operations it was unnecessarily excessive. Right Thank you very much. Can be classified, but it cannot be made legal. That man, Elisa, Ray McGovern, is a good friend of mine. I got to meet him in 2014 in Germany. We spent a night um, singing Irish drinking songs beside a river um, after a conference. He's a great guy. He shows you that, you know, uh, don't ever think that the deep state is just you know, um, one homogenised thing. Now, here's someone who was from the CIA mm. who's exposed these operations, etc. And he's a man of principle, and this is the way he gets treated. But Donald Trump should be listening to him Absolutely. and not these other people that he's listening to at the moment. Yeah. So join our campaign to become a political animal and secure your future. Call your Member of Parliament. Call us for a copy of the manual uh, and get involved in any other way that you can. That's all we've got time for this week. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Elisa. Thanks for tuning in and join us again next week.